This week, I'm chatting with Shiza Shahid, the founder of Our Place, a cookware company that's cultivating connection by celebrating global culinary traditions. Shiza is a truly inspirational woman who went from being an advocate for girls and women's education in her native Pakistan to building the Nobel Laureate awarded Malala Fund. Now her goal is to create a mission-driven social enterprise through selling beautifully crafted multi-purpose pieces like the Always Pan, which doubles as a steamer, a saucier, a fry pan, and a spoon rest. Think of it as the capsule wardrobe for your kitchen. Today, Shiza and I are chatting about everything from the ancient healing techniques of Ayurveda to why socially conscious business is the way to make real and sustained change, and why kitchery is not just one of the most fun dishes to say, but to eat too. Thanks so much for joining me, Shiza. How are you and Amir holding up? You know, we're okay. We're, you know, obviously angry, grieving, um, trying to show up in the right way as a business um, and for our community and for our team. So we shut down all marketing for the week. We um, gave our team uh, Monday off fully and a lot of them took off. Um, like any anytime it was like, if you need to go to a protest to clean up, a meeting like no questions asked we'll take on like the founding team will do your work and go um so um you know just giving them space to do whatever they they participate in whatever way they need it and you know if, if if that's just like resting and absorbing and reading like that's fine too whatever you need to be a part of this in your own way and putting out messaging on Instagram and email and our, on our channels about what we stand for and amplifying black voices on our, which, which we've always done, but in this moment um, sort of recommitting to that um, and giving back. And so just trying to show up in the right way. I think it's really good that we're addressing all of this because it is something that has been built into your brand from the very beginning which is why I was so drawn to it. You guys are great storytellers. The events that you do always really integrate that story. And you're working with um, makers all around the world that are from diverse backgrounds and helping to tell stories of culture through food, which I love. Can you tell everybody a little bit about the Our Place brand and how you guys are doing that? So Our Place is a mission-driven company and we are all about home cooking and we believe home cooking is the heartbeat of, of culture, of tradition, of identity, of heritage, of love, of community, of healing. You know, I, I speak for myself. I'm an immigrant to the United States. I grew up in Pakistan. I'm probably more fluent in English than I am in my native tongue, Urdu. But you come into my kitchen and you will not just know who I am. You'll know who my grandmother was. And home cooking is this place where all of our most treasured memories, identities, heritage, cultures live when sort of all else has, has fallen away. Um, and, uh, and that was what we wanted to celebrate with this company was to create a business that centers on the power of home cooking and the power that home cooking has to connect and to create products that make it easier to cook at home so you can spend more time connecting with the ones you love, but also to create what we call our tradition wear, our celebratory assortments that actually center on specific home cooking traditions like Lunar New Year, like Noche Buena, like Shabbat, like Ramadan, um, and to partner with the community from start to finish to create products and experiences and tell stories about that tradition and its significance. I love that. And the pieces are so beautiful. It is this really unique opportunity to share with people the story of, you know, cultural experience um, and not just being like, well, here's a pretty pattern from Oaxaca. Isn't this great? Instead, you know, providing people with the backstory of not only where it's made and you guys also have the ethics built into all of that, but also what those traditions there are and like how they're traditionally used. I mean, one of my pet peeves is always seeing like tagines and like you, they're everywhere. They're in photos of you know food all over food media, but I don't think anybody really ever thinks like, well, where did that come from? And well, why did they use that? And you know, what's the story behind that? So I think it's really cool that you guys are doing that in a way that doesn't feel forced. It feels very organic and is also like very inclusive and just very pretty. Like these these pans. I love the um is it the everyday pan? Always pan. Mm-hmm. Always pan. I love the always pan. Ugh. The colors are so good. They're like this beautiful, very neutral, you know, I would say it's sort of like a matted Instagram pink. My name is Spice. Um, So we have Spice, which is this really beautiful blush terracotta. 
We have our new color, Sage, which is this gorgeous green. We have Char, which is sort of your black, traditional black color. Then we have Steam, which is this really beautiful neutral tan. Um, and we have a, a new color coming out in September that was voted by our community um, that we're really excited about. Oh, I love that. And it's such a great thing too, to think of the always pan, because in the food world, there are so many different utensils you can use. And it's like, it's very easy to rack up this collection of stuff, almost like, you know, you need to Marie Kondo your kitchen, you know, like, do we really need anything? I use my cast iron, like seven out of seven days, like all, always, it's my always pan and all the other stuff. It's like, do I really need this junk? And who knows where a lot of that stuff was made. It's just kind of stuff I've collected over the years. So I love the idea. It's almost like a capsule collection for your kitchen. Well, first of all, we've got to get you an always pen. Um, cast iron is amazing, but it, it, you know, it, it can be a little bit more difficult to cook with um, sometimes, especially for the beginner cook, which I know you're not. Um, but for me, I, I was uh, a novice in the kitchen. I still am. I grew up in a family where my mother, you know, she didn't really get the liberties that I had um, to pursue my career in higher education. And she had to sacrifice a lot of those dreams to be, um, to be homekeeping um, and to be cooking and cleaning. And, uh, and she wanted her daughters to get out there and just do whatever they wanted to do. And the way she did that was by not teaching me to cook. She was like, I'll take care of the cooking. You focus on your studies. You know, you'll always be nearby. I'll make sure, you know, you always have food. And then, of course, I flew halfway across the world um, and didn't have any, you know, aunties or relatives to drop off food. And for 10 years, ate in, you know, takeout and in dining halls and and felt really unhealthy and felt really disconnected from my culture and my identity. And, and so set out on this journey of learning how to cook and how to integrate these memories and recipes from my childhood with where I was living, you know, California and, and the seasonal vegetables and produce that that existed here and in the ways in which my own palate had evolved since I'd been living all around the world. And I was really intimidated by the cookware that the industry sold. It was all 16 piece cookware sets, all of these pots and pans with really specific shapes and sizes, each of which are intended to do one or two very specific things, right? Your, your saucier or your saucepan or your skillet or, you know, the list sort of goes on and on. And, and the idea was, well, how many use cases can we combine in one and create one product that kind of does most of them, right? I wouldn't say all of them, but most of them. It can be your steamer and your spatula and your spatula rest and your saucier and your fry pan and your nonstick pan and just make it really easy to use. So it's, you know, got a great nonstick coating. It's easy to wipe clean. It's got a four spouts and a spatula rest and everything just sort of fits together. So you have this one thing and you know whether you're frying eggs or, or making soup, you can kind of do it all in one and just start with this sense of ease and simplification so that people can get in the kitchen and start cooking. It's so important now too, because all of us are spending so much time in the kitchen with being you know under shelter in place orders. And I think it really has inspired people to you know, really get back to our roots and, you know, explore learning for a lot of people, you know, it's the first time similar to what you described, you know, they're like, Oh my God, I have no idea what I'm doing. But I think in that sense, it's been a great learning experience for a lot of people. And I'm also noticing a, a lot of my friends and self-included are going back to those like comfort dishes that we loved so much growing up that just like give us this sense of, Oh, it's like a soul hug, which we all really need right now. What have you been cooking a lot in quarantine? Because I know we're all going back to our roots right now and really getting into those comfort foods that we all grew up with. Yeah, I've been cooking a lot of kitchery. So kitchery is something I grew up with. It, it literally means mixture and it's a mixture of rice and lentils usually. And I use basmati rice and yellow split mung beans. And I just mix them together and cook them all in one in my always pan with a little bit of ghee and some spices. I tend to use turmeric, cumin, ginger, salt, and pepper, really simple. Kitchery is something that I always had when I was unwell back home. It's often fed to you if you're not feeling well, if you have an upset stomach, and it has roots in Ayurveda. Ayurveda is South Asian traditional medicine. It's all about balance and synchronicity and, and the idea that things are not inherently bad or good for you, but that the way that you consume them matters. So for example, um, 
turmeric lattes, which are very trendy in LA right now, um, you know, come from Ayurveda. And I grew up have, having turmeric and milk. And, and the idea is milk, as we know, can be quite inflammatory and turmeric is anti-inflammatory. So you sort of put them together and you have this um, this drink that actually can be quite nourishing and you're counteracting some of the and some of the inflammatory properties. And so Ayurveda, rather than following this Western um, wellness trend of, you know, gluten is bad or dairy is bad or, you know, this is good. It's, well, what are you eating? What does your body tend to do well with? What is the season? What is the climate? How are the various spices interacting with each other? Um, and it's a really beautiful way of eating that I've been trying to integrate a little bit more into my life. It is fascinating. I have to say I hadn't really experienced Ayurveda until I went to Surya Spa for the mm -hmm. first time for a story, which was incredible. And Marta is like, mm -hmm. truly has a gift from God or goddess, whatever you want to call it out there. I was a skeptic a little bit with the whole pulse work. I walk into her place and she's like, sit down. She just put her uh, fingers right on my pulse point of my wrist and said nothing. I was like, what the heck is this lady doing? And she's feeling, pushing, putting some pressure, feeling around. And after about five minutes of her kind of going through different pulse points, she was able to dissect without me saying a word problems that I've been dealing with my whole life. And she was, I was like, how did you know that from pushing on my, <laughs> my wrist, from feeling my pulse? And it was incredible to learn from her exactly what you're describing. She would talk about the foods I should and shouldn't be eating um, based on my, you know, vata, pita, all that, that jazz. Um, I run hot, no surprise there. Um, but it's really interesting. Like you mentioned, it's not this one size fits all style of, of medicine. Um, it's much more holistic and it's, it's fascinating. And that um, kitchery sounds so wonderful and healthful. Um, I got to try that. Yeah. So yeah, good. Well, when this is all over, I will have you over again um, and I will make you some kitchery and we will, uh, we will interact in person, which uh, I can't wait for us to be able to do that again. Oh my gosh. I can't wait A, to see you again, IRL, but also your home is the most beautiful place. It's so global and eclectic and just like so tastefully done. Everything that's there feels very thoughtful, which I think speaks so much to the brand itself. You've seen the world. The thing that I think is so fascinating, by the way, is how you came to this because you were the founder and CEO of the Malala Fund, right? Yeah. How the heck did you go from that to then starting a cookware company? I feel like it was just sort of, meant to be. Um, you know, I've always thought about what is it that I can be doing in this moment that that would have the greatest impact. And when I was growing up, I was volunteering in micro enterprise and microfinance and refugee camps uh, in my home country, Pakistan. Um, I was speaking out for girls' education and women's rights in my home country. When I was in my early 20s, it was building the Malala Fund um, and working on this global education cause. And now in my, in my early 30s, it's, I believe, building a mission, a truly mission-driven business, uh, because we have to show that you can be a mission-driven business that does well if we are going to solve the world's most pressing challenges. I've spent a lot of my life in the nonprofit space and I have tremendous respect for the work of nonprofits. But if we're going to solve climate change and the refugee crisis and racial injustice and income inequality, we need to get businesses to step up and do their part because trillions are traded in the financial markets every day and, and nonprofits are, are a fraction of that. So to me, it's you know proving that you can build a business that does good and that all businesses need to be thinking about things like sustainability and ethical sourcing and representation um, if they're going to succeed. Um, and also for me at this time as an immigrant, to the United States as a, a Muslim, a, a woman, a person of color, a, a Pakistani, you know, sort of um, in the eyes of many Americans, I, I probably am the other. 
And yet this is a country that I have chosen and love and um, have spoken in 30 states to audiences about social issues and have built a nonprofit here and have gone to college here and have built a business here and have built an investment fund here. Um, and I know that when you know you sit down around a table with people who are different from you and you cook a meal and you share a meal together, uh, that in my opinion is always one of the most powerful ways to dissolve the sense of difference and to bring people together. That's what Anthony Bourdain did so well, right? He walked into people's homes with a camera and ate dinner with them. And, and as people ate with him with their family and explained their food traditions, we all watched and, and despite the different spices and the different clothes, we saw, we saw how similar we were and how, how similar our hopes and aspirations and fears and desires were. And so that's what we're trying to do as a business is to bring the world closer together by sharing stories of, of home cooking and tradition. I love that. It's so beautifully said and so important, especially in this time as we're really seeing the modern civil rights movement take place right before our eyes. I think um, this really powerful uprising that we're seeing is so incredibly inspiring, um, but we really need to make sure that we have this sustained impact, right? And what you said about the trillions of dollars that we're spending every day as Americans, how we invest our hard-earned money, we need to be really thinking about that and supporting businesses that support you. You are more American than mm -hmm. anything else out there. Like to hear you say that you have felt like the other or that people view you as the other, to me, in my mind, I'm like, there is nothing more American than an immigrant who comes here and starts a business and is hustling every day to make that happen and building a community around it. Like that's, we all are immigrants. My great grandparents are immigrants. Like it, unless you're an indigenous person in living in the United States, you're likely from somewhere else. So thinking of people as the other is something we really need to overcome and what better way to do it, as you say, than around a table. Yeah, absolutely. I'm curious, you know, if you can talk a little bit about uh, culinary traditions that you guys have uh, that are sort of embodied through the different dishes. We had that great Lunar New Year party. Can you talk a little bit about that one, perhaps? So Lunar New Year is the largest home cooking tradition in the world. It's celebrated by over a billion people, celebrated in several parts of Asia. We chose to celebrate it from a Chinese American perspective, we think it's really important to be specific. So we partnered with Chinese Americans to tell the story from start to finish. And I think the specificity is, is really critical because if you try and lump too many cultures and identities together, then you are no longer really telling a story that's familiar to anyone. And of course, within Chinese Americans, there is so much diversity as well. But we partnered with a group of Chinese Americans to understand, you know, what is the significance of the tradition to them as Chinese Americans, um, you know, celebrating this tradition in Los Angeles and how does a tradition evolve over time, over place, over generations? And um, what does it mean to celebrate Lunar New Year in Los Angeles today? And we curated this really beautiful group of products. Um, we worked with a Chinese American illustrator to create these gorgeous platters um, that were on the one hand quite traditional. It was this blue and white pattern that you see in a lot of homes, uh, but it was also a modern twist on this tradition. And that's always what we're trying to bring is like what, what happens to traditions in present day, in present moment. Um, and we created these products. We, we interviewed and photographed Chinese Americans um, sharing their stories, sharing how they celebrate. And we, put that out into the world. And, and, and the idea was really just to bear witness, to say, you know, in the culinary space, and particularly when we look at like kitchenware brands, right? Uh, they've celebrated very specific cultures. They've celebrated Italian food and French food, but I've never seen a mainstream culinary brand celebrate Pakistani food, right? Um, and why not? And why don't we celebrate the multitudes of food cultures that make up America, um, in an authentic way and in partnership with the communities whose cultures they are. And, uh, and we've been continuing that conversation, even as coronavirus has broken out. You know, we, 
as this all hit, we were, of course, devastated as everybody was. And we thought, well, what does it mean to be a brand that's all about gathering in a moment when you can't gather? And right as we were starting to shelter in place, you know, it was the month of April and you had Passover and you had Easter and you had Ramadan, you know, cumulatively, those are the home cooking traditions that are celebrated by most people um, around the world. And, and of course, Ramadan's about fasting, but as someone who grew up uh, celebrating Ramadan, you know, it's about fasting, then it's about eating and breaking the fast together. Um, and so, you know, we went out to our community and we spoke to people who were celebrating Ramadan and Passover and Easter and said, well, what, how are you celebrating? And what is the significance of celebrating in this moment? And, and we found that there was a lot of loss, you know, um, for not being able to celebrate the way they, they would have. But also there was something that, that was gained, that was found, like a sense of hope and resilience. So, you know, one of our community members said that she was writing down her mother's recipes uh, because her mother couldn't visit and her kids wanted grandma's food. And she said, well, you know, now that I have these recipes written down, I feel better that, you know, God forbid, if, if anything were ever to happen to my mom, I've, I've preserved these family legacies. And one person said that she was hosting a Passover Seder with 60 members of her family from around the country. And she said, I'm really sad that I can't gather the 26 people I would have usually, but I'm having Passover with people that um, I wouldn't have ever, that I never have. And so finding these, these moments of resilience and hope um, and allowing our traditions to change with the time, but preserving their original integrity and meaning and just continuing that conversation is, is really all that we're about. You know, as much as this time is incredibly challenging, and I certainly wouldn't wish it upon any of us again, I think that things got really easy for us collectively, obviously in broad strokes here as Americans. And we kind of have, you know, all of us tried to work within the system and kind of forgot about our roots, really. And I think this time, you know, really is hopefully helping us tap back into those things and really call on them. Because, you know, if you don't write those recipes down, if you don't sit, you know, around the table, if you don't cook those things that your mama, grandmama made for your children, because you're so busy working, you know, your 80 hour work week that we just never turn off and we're so busy on our phones. Like this has really forced us, I think, to really take stock of those things, which is so incredibly important. And to the tune as well, when you were talking about the the dinner party that we did for Lunar New Year, actually you were the one that introduced me to the fly by Jing sauces that Jenny Gao is doing, which I literally used last night. You guys, these sauces are so fire. Like she has this amazing chili oil that she put um, on ice cream. They're made in the Sichuan province, which is like the, the sort of the hub of spicy mala cooking. And it was so unique to see it on top of McConnell's vanilla ice cream, which I've, I've been to the Sichuan province. Let me tell you, nobody is putting that on ice cream. And it was such a uniquely Chinese American combination. Um, but she was also doing traditional dishes, you know, and she's got these these great sauces. And it was so cool to see someone who's young and hip and a female entrepreneur, you know, doing the darn thing and kind of in this unique bi-coastal sort of way too, because she's going back and forth to the Sichuan province and then here in LA. Um, so it's really, really cool. And you guys had Baijo, which was great because I hadn't had, again, like decent Baijo it is, is hard to find in the States. Um, but a really cool cocktail program. Um, and it introduced a lot of people to the table that hadn't maybe had it before to this, you know, unique Chinese spirit. So I, I really do think that there's a way to honor those traditions and and sort of, I hate to use the word purity or authenticity, but to hold on to like the authentic stories of those foods, but also, you know, honor the unique, um, you know, American story within them. It's It's part yeah. of our history. Yeah. Yeah. Well, now you're making me nostalgic for that, uh, for that dinner and for the time when we could gather. Um, but yeah, there is this remarkable healing, connecting power in sitting around a dinner table and sharing our cultures and cooking and eating food together. Mm -hmm. Um, and it sounds simple and yet it just hits to the core of who we are. Um, 
Absolutely. There's no other species on this planet that does it. They eat together, but they don't really commune and they're not sharing stories as far as we know, as far as, <laughs> you know. Species that cooks. So. Yeah, exactly. Only species that's really cooking and, and, and communing around a table. So it's pretty, it's pretty unique. I mean, you kind of touched on this a little bit, but I'm curious, you know, because everything around the company is built around this idea of fostering community, how would you recommend people at home? You know, we're kind of coming out of shelter in place, but we're still going to be spending a lot of time in our own homes. How do they foster that kind of the spirit of of what you're all about? I don't know. It's a good question. You know, I think it's so uncertain where we're going. I have found in myself at this time, um, because I am not seeing people um, that I'm not, you know, we're now sort of at a place where we, you know, we'll have like my brother and his wife will come and we'll sit seven to eight feet apart in the backyard, right? Or um, like our closest friends might come and we might choose to do a socially distanced hangout and that's it. And so these these gatherings are really deliberate. There's no dinner that I'm going to anymore that I don't really want to, but I got invited and maybe there'll be, you know, maybe I should show up or like, you know, there's not, there, there aren't those wider obligations to gather and what I found is um, I'm cherishing my gatherings a lot more um, because I have the energy for them, because I'm choosing them, because I'm being deliberate about them. And I think that's something that I'm going to take into the time that we move forward, which is um, I missed doing certain things. I missed having a dinner like that dinner that you were at that was deliberate and it was about real conversation and sharing culture. But there were so many other things that we did that were more obligation that were, you know, perhaps going to a work event, but not really sharing who you are or what's on your mind. And it's just small talk. And there's, you know, you're not really diving into anything deeper and you leave those things feeling more exhausted um, than you do feeling energized. And I think just being really deliberate and continuing to be really deliberate about how we gather, how we engage, what is it for, you know, um, and the little choices that we can make, you know, let's get, uh, let's, let's use gatherings to support black owned businesses, female owned businesses. Um, you know, let's um, have a conversation about things that matter. Let's maybe have a call to action. If we're gathering a group around the, the issues that we're all passionate about um, and just putting a lot more thought into, into the gathering that we're doing and the ways in which we're connecting. Where can people follow along with Our Place? So they can follow Our Place on all our Instagram handles at Our Place and uh, Facebook and Twitter um, and also on our website from ourplace.com. Um, and of course, I'm on all the social channels too, with just my name at Shiza. Excellent. Well, thank you so much again. And we will see you IRL around a table very, very soon. I cannot wait. 